This is Chapter 2, The Momentum Principle. The first thing we need to sort out is the concept of the system and the surroundings. When you're working on a problem, it's important to divide the universe into two parts. There's the part you're interested in, or the part you want to focus on, and that's called the system. The rest of the universe, the uninteresting part, is called the surroundings. What you choose as interesting and non-interesting is completely up to you. It's, it's determined entirely by your notion of convenience. What's the simplest thing to do in the, under any circumstances? So there's no correct or incorrect way to divide the universe. The main point of this chapter is the focus on momentum change. The momentum of a system changes when it interacts with its surroundings. Such an interaction can be described using the concept of force. Force is a vector that points in the direction of the interaction and whose magnitude is equal to the size of the interaction. All this boils down to a fundamental statement, which is the main point of this chapter, called the momentum principle. The momentum principle says that the change in the momentum of the system is equal to the net force or the net amount of interaction between the system and its surroundings times the time over which that, in, that uh, force acts. The force is the interaction. It's, it's exerted on, on the system by the surroundings. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have a mass of 2 kilograms moving with an initial velocity of 3 meters per second. That gives us an initial momentum of 6 kilograms meters per second in the x-direction. You can think of that as a vector that points in the positive x-direction with a length of 6 kilogram meters per second, or a magnitude of 6 kilogram meters per second. The force acting on this mass is negative 10 newtons. It's pointing in the negative y-direction with a magnitude of 10 newtons for a time of a tenth of a second. The momentum principle says that if we multiply the net force of interaction on the system by the surroundings, by the time over which the force acts, a tenth of a second, we'll get the change in the momentum of the system. That's a consequence of that force. We can simply multiply. It's a scalar multiplication by a vector. So we end up with a change in momentum of minus 1 kilogram meters per second in the y direction. In other words, a change in momentum, a magnitude, one kilogram meters per second, pointing in the negative y direction. You can think of that as a vector that has a magnitude of one kilogram meters per second and points in the negative y direction. The final momentum is the sum of the initial momentum, our six kilogram meters per second in the positive x direction, and our change in momentum, the negative one kilogram meters per second in the y direction. We can simply add those vectors together, remembering that vectors add by components. So the x components add, the y components add, and the z components add, giving us a net momentum, or final momentum, of 6 in the x direction, minus 1 in the y direction, and 0 in the z direction, all in units of kilograms meters per second. You can think of this as a vector sum, where you've got the initial momentum, the change in the momentum, and the final momentum, the vector sum of those two vectors. Now we know how to update the momentum of a system, which is undergoing an interaction with its surroundings. The next question is, how do we update the position? Remember, when you update position, you need to use the average velocity over the time interval. When a force acts, the velocity is not constant. It varies. How are we going to estimate the change in position when the velocity is changing? We have to use the average velocity over the time interval. In order to calculate the average velocity, it turns out small time intervals work better than large time intervals. And over a small enough time interval, one reasonable approach is to use the arithmetic mean of the initial and final velocities. It turns out the arithmetic mean is exactly correct in the limit when the force is constant. If the force is not constant, then the arithmetic mean is less and less correct. 
Let's look at an example with a constant force at a speed much less than the speed of light. Since the force is constant, it turns out the momentum principle is exact for any size time interval. Remember that the momentum principle is an an s an a uh, it's it's uh, approximately correct if the time interval is small, and the smaller the time interval, the more exactly correct it is. In order to decide how big of a time interval you get, you have to think about how much is the force changing during the time interval. It's nearly correct as long as the force doesn't change very much. So for example, we know that the final momentum is the initial momentum plus the change in momentum, but if the velocity is much less than the speed of light, then the velocity is simply the momentum divided by the mass. So I can divide both sides of this equation by the mass, and I get that the final velocity is the initial velocity plus the force, which is constant, remember, divided by the mass, times the change in time. If I put that into the average velocity, the arithmetic mean of the initial and the final velocity, which is correct as long as the force is constant, then I end up with the expression that the velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus one half of the force divided by the mass times the change in time. If you've had physics before, you might recognize that the force divided by the mass is sim simply the acceleration. That's the uh, rate at which the velocity vector is changing. Of course, once we have the average velocity, we can use the position update formula from last week. That is, the change in the position is the average velocity times the change in the time. Putting that all in, we get the final position is the initial position plus the initial velocity times the change in time plus one-half the force over the mass times the change in time squared. Continuing with the idea of an example, let's uh, get some specific numbers in there. Let's imagine we have a three-tenth kilogram ball thrown from the origin with an initial velocity of 2010 meters per second. In other words, 2 meters per second in the x direction, 0 meters per second in the y direction, and 10 meters per second in the z direction. But it's under the influence of a constant force of 3 newtons acting in the negative z direction. What's the velocity and position of the ball at some later point in time? Well, we have two update formulas we need to apply. One is the velocity update formula. Remember, this works when the force is constant. We put in the force, we put in the initial velocity, and we get an equation that tells us that the velocity at some later time is 2 meters per second in the x direction, 0 meters per second in the y direction, and 10 minus 10 times the change in time meters per second in the z direction. Similarly, we can use the position update formula, putting in the initial position, the initial velocity, and the force, to calculate the final position at any point in time. We get that the final x component of the position is 2 times delta t, the y component is 0, and the z component is 10 times the change in time minus 5 times the change in time squared. So for example, after 1 and 2 seconds, respectively, the final position is 205 and 400. Notice that after 2 seconds, the object has reached 5 meters in the z direction, but at 4 seconds, I'm sorry, at 2 seconds, it's uh, back down to 0 again. Whereas in the x direction, the motion is uniform. It starts at the origin at 0 seconds, at 1 second it's at 2 meters, at 2 seconds it's at 4 meters, and you can guess at 3 seconds it would be at 6, and then 8, and then 10, and so on. It's useful to visualize what's happening here to use a graph. So I've made a couple of graphs of what's going on here. We've got the graph of the x and z components of velocity and graphs of the x and z component of position called just x and z. First of all I want to look at the velocities. The x component of velocity is constant. This makes sense because a constant x component of velocity implies a constant x component of momentum. Remember the force only acted in the z direction so that means the change in the momentum occurs only in the z direction the x component of momentum is constant. On the other hand, in the z direction, the z component of momentum has to be changing, and it's got to be decreasing, because the z component of momentum is changing by the force that acts in the z direction.
On the other hand, the, uh, the velocity is the rate of change of the corresponding position. So the x component of velocity is the rate of change of x. The z component of velocity is the rate of change of z. So you can see that the x position is increasing at a constant rate because the x component of velocity is constant. On the other hand, the, the z component of position increases at the beginning. In the middle, it's not increasing at all. And at the end, it's actually becoming more negative with time. And that's also consistent with the z component of velocity. Now, there are some more complicated kinds of problems we can have where the force is not constant. So for example, we can have different knowns and unknowns. Maybe we do know the force, and we do know the change in momentum, but we don't know the time, and so on. We could have more than one force. Remember, it's the net force, or the sum of all the forces, that causes the change in momentum. As I said, we can have non-constant forces. And finally, we can have multiple particles and multiple objects. At that point, we can decide to make the system all the objects together, or sometimes it might be useful to pick one of the objects and make that the system and treat the other objects as the, as the surroundings. So there's different approaches you have to take, and it just takes practice to learn how to do that. We'll go over some examples on Wednesday uh, of homework problems and so on. But just be aware that um, once you've got the basic idea, there's different ways to apply those ideas. Finally, I want to point out the notion of the conservation of momentum. First of all, the momentum of the universe as a whole is always strictly conserved. That means if you take the momentum of the system plus the momentum of the surroundings added together, the total momentum of the entire universe always is, is the same at the beginning and the end of any problem. This makes sense because the momentum principle can apply to the system or to the surroundings. But the force on the system due to the surroundings turns out to always be the opposite of the force on the surroundings due to the system. And so if you work it out, you can see that the change in the momentum of the surroundings is always the opposite of the change in the momentum of the system. So when you add them together, the total change in momentum of the entire universe is always zero. If you have a problem where the system doesn't interact significantly with its surroundings, then it means the change in the momentum of the system is equal to zero. In other words, the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum. In that situation, we say that the momentum of the system is conserved. But of course, we know that in all cases, the momentum of the system plus the surroundings is conserved. Anyway, that's really all there is this week. We'll do some examples on Wednesday and see how this stuff works.